Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast ran by some makerspace directors and affiliates and a president and a couple other people in there. We just throw them all together. They're just having a fun time. Nice. We're just <laughs> we're having a good time tonight. I'm your host, Christian. Uh, joining me tonight are Aaron and Joe. And tonight we're going to be talking about a couple cool topics. We're going to go through um, some news topics and... We're going to talk about a little bit about post-MIRF. We're going to touch on that a little bit because this is the first podcast we've actually done post-MIRF together, which is a huge thing. Um, And But first, we're going to start off right with, what are you guys drinking tonight? I have zombie dust, and I'm real happy about it. (laughs) Fair enough, fair enough. Did you get that while you were up in Chicago? Polis got it for me. Uh okay. Nice. Thank you, there Steve. You <laughs> they actually had a gumball head in bottles over at Ulrich's. What? Ooh. Yeah. I had one in the last few. He said they had a few left. Gumball head is so tasty but so weird. Like... <laughs> I don't think I've had that one. <laughs> it tastes like a gumball flavored IPA. It's a very strange flavor. I don't but know it... how I'd feel about gumball and beer. Exactly. It's good yeah. and bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have from I'm I'm not going to mention their name in case they don't want me to. Um, but from one of our guests uh, that came up to the booth actually came up and gave me a beer. So first of all, thank you. Um, Jealous. I didn't get <laughs> a beer from a guest. We uh well they came well, up and they were kind of fans Steve. of the show, um and so they came over and uh, as he was getting ready to leave for the show or uh, leave Murph, um he came up and was like, hey, I want to give this beer. Hopefully you'll enjoy it on the podcast. And I was like, hell yeah! And so I'm going to be drinking tonight, um, Decker Brewing Company, involuntary narcissistic. Um, nice. so it is a it. lactose double IPA. Uh, so I'm gonna literally a, a lactose. I'm jealous. So milky. Yeah. Apparently it's going to be a little milky. So I'm going to give you a first taste impressions real quick. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is exactly <laughs> what you would think a double IPA with a little bit of milk in it would taste like. Um, it's not bad. Um, it's a little bit smoother in an IPA yeah. than uh, I'm normally used to, but you can still definitely taste that bitter part in the back um, that you always get from IPA. So uh, thank you out there. Uh, I'm sure you know who you are. Uh, and we thank you for listening to the podcast and enjoying all the content we have. Um, this again, is the most engaged I've been for a beer review on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. It, it it's good. I like it. It's it's. I'm I'm about it. I haven't. I never even knew this brewing company existed. So this is kind of fun for me to begin with. There's so um, many brewing companies. How could you know if they all exist? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um. With that, I actually like. We're, we're only going to touch on this a little bit. But what? How are you guys feeling? We're we're at this point two weeks past Murph. Um, we had a freaking blast at murph um what like how are you guys feeling well i'll start by saying i'm drinking an apple pie <laughs> liquor that's still sitting here because you enough. just blatantly skipped me <laughs> yup <laughs> i actually haven't drank much at all since we all just assumed interviews. that you've been drinking kirkle and vodka like water since murph <laughs> I've drank almost nothing since Murph. I don't doubt I'm it. I'm not surprised. <laughs> There's definitely a negative connotation still. For for those that don't know, Aaron didn't actually make it to the second day of Murph because Saturday almost killed him. He called us and he said that he thought he had food poisoning and we reminded him that it was probably some other form of poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're here. I really <laughs> thought it was, but I think the, the the super hot sauce and the tacos added like additional thing to it, oh, which is what, which was kind of be like the the red herring 
Oh, which man. made me thought it was food poisoning. Those those tacos were so good, though. They Dude, were very good. So they were good. bomb. Like, they, they were, man, they were so good. They were, I remember having tacos, I think, two years ago. Uh, and they were just like normal street tacos. And it was like, eh, okay. These ones, like, they went all out. Like, they had peppers. They had, like, roast beef. They had brisket. Like, all this really good stuff. Like, oh, it was good tacos. <laughs> yeah, I just I had... mean, it was like, it was like Chipotle where they you have, like, all these options. Yeah. Yep. And no matter what you choose, it'll, it'll always end up being good. Yeah. I had Tim just go back and get me a big plate of pork. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I should have done. <laughs> it was, oh, it was, it was such a fun time. Um, it, we we highly suggest if you haven't been able to, um, please go through and listen to the past two podcasts. Um, they were so much fun to do with you guys. They were an incredible experience just to sit down and chat with everybody about um, what they love about Murph so much and the community that is happening there. It was an incredible time. So if you haven't already listened to it, I highly suggest just taking a little bit of time and listening to those two episodes. Um, so, but with that, we're going to jump into the news topics. Hey, uh, we did. I, <laughs> we haven't all talked about our things. Aaron barely talked about his alcohol. Hashtag worst toast how, ever. Sure. How, sure. Let's <laughs> how, go. How, I how was do you guys to roll feel? through it. No, no, you're good. You're good. How, um, how do you guys feel about post Murph? How, how are you feeling, Chris? I am. I so, um, whenever it comes to cons, I always have what in the con community is described as post con depression. Yep. Um, where <laughs> it's you finally get that time with all your internet friends, and you get to see them and spend twenty four seven with them for three days. And it's fucking fantastic. And then all of a sudden they're gone again. And the only like place you can see them is either on Facebook or um, the internets and whatnot. And so it really sucks afterwards because you're like, I was like just used to not being around you and was finally coping with it six <laughs> months after the last event. And then it all came crashing back. Um, and so I kind of felt like that with, with Murph, although I don't know a whole lot of people there, there was a lot of people I built really quick friendships with, um, quick shout out to, uh, Sam number two, um, me and him got away, got along so well, uh, and we were so good friends by the end of that. Um, I miss him already. He is fantastic. Uh, but yeah, like, he's probably got this blaring in the shop right yeah. now. Sam too, <laughs> and and honestly, the whole E three D crew. Yeah, no, like even getting to just sit down with the whole E three D crew was like a blast. Um, like them and Laws or Lawsbot, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you know that company, Lols, um, Lulzbot, uh Claudio especially. Um, just even getting to talk with him for a couple minutes, like dude's freaking awesome. Um, yes, and. He was he was incredible to finally put a face to the name and get to talk to him. Um, give a quick shout out to 3D Printing today. We had an amazing interview with him, and I felt we we made um, a friend. Yeah, in, totally. In that podcast, um, and so they they were super cool. Um, and just getting to talk to him for a little bit, uh, and then uh, two new friends for me, uh, Amy Double D. Uh, I got to talk to her for a little bit uh, and do the interview, and that was super fun. Uh, go check her stuff out on social as well. Definitely. And uh, I'm forgetting her name, and I feel horrible, but uh, Broke Ass Wonder Woman on uh, the social medias. Uh, she was also really cool, and I got to talk to her while we were all drinking, um, and it was super fun. So I'm hoping to get in contact with her, and we might have a special interview in the future. Um, but I just got really slammed with work last week and wasn't able to reach out. So. Uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we're able to have her on and just talk with her for a little bit because she does some really fucking cool art. Yes. But yeah, that's that's kind of my my thoughts on the weekend. Uh, I am super sad. I am missing all of my friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my uh, my thing was uh, slammed so much harder. <laughs> like mine started as 
like we were sitting at Taco Bell in Goshen and everyone was already asking me if I was okay. And I was just like, I just, I just miss all my friends and I just, I'm not feeling okay about leaving Murph. And then, then I came back and had a major life change and I've been dealing with that for the last couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's been, it's been interesting. I still haven't even put my printers back together. Like that, that's where I'm at with yeah. post Murph. Um, hopefully that happens tomorrow, but it's been a, an interesting couple of weeks. We'll put it like that. Aaron. So this was my second Murph. I went in 2017 and I just hung out with the RCL guys and really talked to many people. But, uh, this being the first year we've done the podcast, I, you know, I tried to put myself out there and meet new people. I kind of followed Joe around and met the people he talked to and you know, made, made some new friends, made some contacts. Uh, I've been talking with Carl from white, from a uh, knack 3d designs uh, about the belt printer stuff. He's oh, been yeah. fun to talk to. Yeah. He's, he's a cool dude. Talking with him, we um, came up with the belt printer forums um, to help centralize the discussion on people who want to build belt, belt and infinite style printers. I also met Justin, uh, Nestle Roddy. Nestle wrote. Uh, Nestle wrote. Yeah. He was super fun to hang out with. And, uh, also incredibly kind of, wonderful person, author yes. of Thought Q. <laughs> yes, yeah. I told him that he needs to be on the podcast soon, not just on the the Murph interviews. Hell yeah, we he, bonded over being developers. He is down. It's it's definitely an odd feeling being in an environment like that for an entire weekend, where everybody's on the same wavelength, where you're there with people who are passionate about something you know for this it was 3d printing but you're also talking with all you're all just a bunch of nerds too so you're just nerding out over the technology and maybe you're nerding out over the motion systems or the mechatronics and you know everywhere you you walk by you 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 hear people talking about you know uh stepper motors or or their their calibration settings or whatever and everybody's on the same wavelength and then you go home and you know for a lot of us we're kind of like we're each kind of the, the the technical person in our group of family, friends, whatever. So you get back to real life, and you're back to being like no one else to talk to, really. Why doesn't anyone understand me? <laughs> well, exactly. It was, it was so cool <laughs> um, to bring a quote from uh, broke ass Wonder Woman. Um, we were talking, and it was it was kind of funny. Aaron saw it a couple times where people would actually come up and uh, comment on my laptop skins uh, and they would be like, yeah, yo, wait, you into my hero? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm into my hero. <laughs> and like th there was this small community within the Murph that's like, yo, all of us are just going to take over this thing. It's going to be an anime convention in like three years. <laughs> like we're just going to have cosplay everywhere. And I'm like, I'm so about this, please. Like, it was so cool to just see like all of the different cultures that went in that was so focused on 3D printing, but also like all of your friends were here. Like there were so many people making like um, one of the coolest printers that we talked about uh, with uh, 3D printing today was the shelf printer. And like the first print that he had on that thing was a buster sword from Final Fantasy VII. It was like, frick yeah, like everybody's like totally into this geek culture and it's so fucking fun like it was it was just an amazing place and um yeah it's it it sucks to like come back and then you're like ah, i just i guess i need to spend more time at the makerspace <laughs> <laughs> but yeah do you guys have any more murph thoughts i mean i could talk for days about murph we already know this so <laughs> fair enough fair enough well, Aaron, anything? I think I'm good. All I right. think I'm ready for the news. You ready for the news? Let's news it up. All right. Well, first off, we have the Polypanels 3D printed construction system. I am seeing these all over Twitter, but they are called Polypanels. His name is Devin Montez. He is, his Twitter handle and YouTube is Make Anything. But these are, it reminds me of those old, uh, it's, it's it's like a Nex where you have all these different shapes and they all have 
uh, universal connectors on the edges so they can connect different panels together to make you know shapes or enclosures or anything. But it reminds me of those old hamster cages. If you ever had oh. uh, like a hamster or a mouse, mm -hmm. they're, they're they're like those little squares and they're interlocking square panels that they they kind of interlock, you know, at right angles, um, flat planes. But with the poly, with these poly panels, they can attach to each other in different angles and they can attach in a hinge format or they can lock in place at a 90. Um, there are squares, there's triangles, so you can get cool um, bevels or angles into things. Um, there's hinges. He has several different varieties that are out there that you can download and they just snap together. And that's literally all it is. So it's like, it's literally like connects, but his own little thing. And they're all in panel form. And Rad. the website is super put together. I mean, there's little GIFs for showing how they all connect and all the different ways you can connect them. Um, well, we kind of so there's some specialty panels that have a bearing in it. Um, some that are meant to be printed with flexible um, filament, so you get this weird like bungee effect. I mean, man, the, the possibilities are endless with this. <laughs> um, I'm about it. Yeah, it, it's really neat. Um, all the files are up on my mini factory. We'll have the link in the show notes. Um, one thing that kind of bugged me though is that it's some sort of permissive license. The thing that bothers me is that there is no actual license attached to this. Okay. Which, which means that technically you can't do anything with it unless there's an actual license attached to it, whether it's Creative Commons or an actual open source license. Um, Why it not? says on the, My, on the My Mini Factory page, it's got those little icons. So it says you can, you know, download, 3D print, share, but you have to maintain the license. But again, there's nothing on here. You can't, you have to, you know, credit the designer when sharing the object. You are, you are able to remix it and share your remix. Uh, you can't make money off of it or use it commercially. Um, and this design itself is exclusively on my mini factory. Hmm. But so that, that all lends itself to, you know, a Creative Commons type license where it's permissive. Um, but restrictive where you can't use it commercially. Um, you have to attribute the author, but again, there's no actual license file attached to any of the downloads, which probably not a big deal, but again, it could be a legal thing. Yeah. Joe, you had the next topic. <laughs> yeah. So, um, this topic is a couple of weeks old now, but, um, uh, I, I really wanted to cover it because, uh, I had a part in it. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, um, a new project magazine, online magazine, launched called OK Do. Um, it's okdo.com. And um, it's kind of like uh, Make, but in the sense that um, every project is tied to a single board computer type of uh, project basis. So think Raspberry Pi, Latte Panda, Beagle Moan Black kind of base. Um, and they did a really good job of curating all of these boards and also uh, curating projects to uh, help you along in your journey for um, you know, learning how to uh, develop on these boards. And I had the... Uh, opportunity to do one of the first articles on the website for projects. So um, if you go to okdo.com slash projects um, and go into the recent projects, you can find an article called Home Automation for Your Critters. And uh, this is me walking you through how to do a uh, terrarium pie based controller for um, like a lizard terrarium and my specific application was controlling my terrarium for my chameleon jelts. And, uh, it's been, it was really fun to write it. Uh, I haven't found any other tutorials that go into this amount of depth for terrarium pie. So I was excited to actually, um, kind of give a step-by-step -step on how to make a functional, uh, computer controlled terrarium using a really nice open source software. So, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. A little self oh, plug there. <laughs> I'm not about so, it right now. The <laughs> site is super neat. It's almost too neat. It's beautiful. Yeah. They a did a lot of effort was put into the site. Yeah, the the UI is gorgeous. Um the the mobile UI leaves something to be desired, I think, but um and we actually have a couple friends that are uh behind the the community. So Matt Stoltz from uh that uh I've known for years from uh Murph and Maker Fairs. He's the community manager and uh then um yeah matt's pretty awesome so shout out to matt and for bringing me on for writing neat articles hell yeah can't be that curated though why because it let me on (laughs) no that'd be that'd be too easy of a joke joe (laughs) no so there i'm looking on the projects page i was skimming through some of these there's the one called control adjust boom with alexa and the premise is exposing port 80 on your router without a password to oh. a raspberry pi <laughs> oh so <laughs> oh <laughs> okay not that curated well i mean they're curated in the sense that like these are projects we... for things that we sell and uh I, yeah yeah i don't know yeah I can, I can just, say just that my project doesn't do that. <laughs> I, I know you know better. Jeez. <laughs> oh, <crap. laughs> um. All right. Well, with that, um, we got one more article, and this one is pretty cool. Color Fab is releasing a expanding foaming PLA called uh, LW Filament PLA. Um. With for FDM 3D printing and kind of the uh, TLDR is uh, WLPLA is really unique printing material for 3D printing. Uh, it is somewhat challenging to initially set up, but can once calibrated for your printer can produce great results for importantly for lightweight 3D printed parts. Uh, what's kind of your guys' thoughts on this one? So we talked about this as a product uh, right when they launched it a couple weeks ago. But the interesting part now is it's actually been put in people's hands. And uh, Rich Wrap uh, did a really nice in-depth blog post on its uses and kind of the material properties behind it and uh, um, gave some good use cases for it. So just wanted to highlight Rich's work and um, and all that. Yeah. There's a really neat picture on there which shows the differences in how it expands based on temperature. So the concept is that, you know, the hotter you print it, the more it expands and foams up, which um, what reduces the density so it's lighter. Yeah. So the sweet spot seems to be, or I guess the, the threshold is around 225 where it starts to, to puff up more. And there's a really neat graphic here where he has, um, it looks like he printed like a vertical tower and then had it change temperature at certain layers so you get a gradual puffing effect and then he actually delineated each marking with the temperature so you can have a good reference for that oh that's yeah if if anyone ever has uh questions or ideas for 3d printing always check rich's blog because it's just it's full of so much good information yeah we'll definitely leave this in the show notes because there's there's a lot of information to go through like it's it's quite a few scrolls, but he definitely went in depth on being able to explore the properties of the filament and whatnot. It's really freaking cool. Well, with so, that, so uh, onto our our real topic, yeah, which is Aaron. What's our our topic? main topic? Our main topic is. <sighs> I'm never good at wording this. <laughs> Never put enough thought into the actual wording of it. Coding coders aren't real makers. That's I mean, a real that's, topic, right? That's the premise. Well, <laughs> I like to I like to I like to make it more generic. Of like things that are making that aren't nece- that aren't mainstream making. It's so like when you think of a maker, you think, you know, maybe three D printing, maybe CNC stuff. There's a physical maybe, part to it. 
Yeah, it's definitely a lot of the physical, tangible aspects yeah. that people associate with making, and then the code always gets brushed to the side. More like when you watch you aspect of the eventual product. Yeah, like you know, they always say you know it's about the journey, not the destination. See, but you see all these YouTube videos. Like I was watching one from Michael Reeves, and he you know he shows you all the cool shit that he throws the hot glues together and all the servos and shit. But then he's like. And but it took me like you know ten hours to code all this stuff. But I'm not gonna bore you with that nerd shit. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of want to see the nerd shit. <laughs> stuff like that. So like, I completely disagree with that concept of coding isn't making because so many projects that I want to do are held up by the fact that I'm not very good at code, and and even with my current life circumstance. Uh, yeah, I I went into an interview today and just got hammered on my coding ability, which is minimal. Um, you know, I I can, and I would like to do better, but I'm not. I am not a computer science guy by any means, and uh, and and that's holding me back in a lot of areas that I would like to be much better. So the the thought that coders uh, aren't makers just drives me insane. Like the the fact that somebody would even have that concept. Uh, like if you're trying to make compelling YouTube content, I, I get it. Watching code scroll by is kind of meh when there could be servos moving and lasers going and people being burnt by hot glue. But um the backbones of every good like mechatronic project is the code. I felt this way for a while. Like I've been I've been in IT pretty much my entire life, just as a hobbyist and then going to school for it. Um becoming a developer, becoming an a software engineer. Um I like it because it, it's it's a form of engineering, so it's a form of problem solving. You know, you're you're you you know you're piecing things together you're solving puzzles definitely but i've always felt like it's been lacking something because how because of how intangible it is and that's that's kind of why i've started learning a lot more of uh you know 3d printing cnc machines um machine design because you know when you design and make something with that you actually have a physical thing you can touch and you can show off like i could code this awesome cool thing but can't really show that to my wife you'd be like that's neat honey <laughs> you know please go away i like that your button <laughs> did something <laughs> yeah uh this whole discussion kind of stemmed off of a, a, a tweet that i saw a month or two ago with the hashtag coding is making and you know like that, that resonated with me you know i just never i never really crossed my mind really I've always kind of brushed it aside because I've done it my entire life. Um, so coding doesn't really seem that special anymore. That's that's kind of like me walking around Murph where I'm like, everybody's got a 3D printer and until you get into the nuance of it. And <laughs> then, you know, you find out some dude made a printer from a shelf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, it, it's the same way probably for you with code where you're like, Oh, look, another guy made a blinky thing on an Arduino, and then you get into the nuance of his code, you're like, holy crap, that's elegant. How'd you do that? So, <laughs> what was... So, I'll, I'll go into a little bit. Because I, I, I code a little bit, mainly networking stuff, but that's about it. Um, permissions and, like, routing and whatnot. But... Um, I did have like that one thing that sparked my coding interest, um, which was I saw a post on Reddit years ago about you can create this executable that goes in an email. Um, and if you press the button in the email, then, and it says like, click here to get your free coffee holder. It'll open the disk tray. And so I made the executable and it was like, it worked. And so I like sent out a mass email to everybody on my email chain and like everybody was commenting back was like, Oh, that's so funny. Blah, blah, blah. And it was really fun. Like that was the first like piece of code that like 
sparked my coding interest. So what was the first like maker piece of code that you guys did that really like, I did this, I finally got it to freaking work. And I, I spent hours on this code, like I got it. Your thing is only so hilarious because of how scary it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your, your first piece of code was a virus. Good job. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go into that half, but yeah, I was I was on some other forums on Reddit. Probably not the best forums on Reddit. <laughs> it was the same for me, too. It was um, going in and finding ways to uh, do chat room progs, like back in the early, early, early internet web Ooh. days when like you could all of a sudden draw an ASCII image of boobs in a chat room and then everyone <laughs> would get really mad because nice. you did that, like. That was Excellent. what kind of sparked my in, my interest in coding, um, and then like my first maker project though, I um, built. I this was when I was still into uh, flow arts, so I was like doing fire performance and stuff. And at the time, nobody had dove into making a programmable LED prop yet. Um. So I huh. made a programmable LED contact staff and I could change the flash patterns of the LEDs by uh, capacitive touch. So depending on how much of my hand was contacting the aluminum of the staff, I could change the flash patterns. And what the crap? Yeah, Do you I still was, have this. It, it's it's in my garage. It doesn't work anymore. Um, I mean, like. I, I Joe finished it like there were there were wires hanging out of it and like the the battery was electrical taped in like it, I'd wrap electrical tape around the battery terminals and electrical tape it into the staff and you uh, all about it uh, but it you know it worked uh, this was before LED strips were a thing so I hand soldered every LED in uh, it ran off of a teensy. So like not even our true Arduino, but like a little baby Arduino with a yeah. even more difficult programming interface, and uh, it worked. It worked well. Um, had I everyone stuck... learn how to use a tinies and teensies? It's like the next step down from a a micro. Yeah. You go from the the Uno to a smaller micro, then you're like <laughs> you can go smaller. Yeah. It... Go teensy and then you go a tiny. It was <laughs> it was a really fun project to figure out. Um, you know, it, it had I stuck with it, I probably could have made a living off that staff. Like, if I would have stuck with it another year and got to the point where it was manufacturable, I probably could have made a job out of that thing. But because I was way ahead of the market. But, Fair enough. you know, in true Joe fashion, I solved the problem and I moved on to the next fun thing. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron? So I grew up working on computers and just playing around with them. Um, I didn't really start learning to code until high school where I was in an intro to programming class and we did Python and we did Visual Basic. So I did I did some really simple Python scripts and I even got to the point where I started writing my own uh, role-playing game, uh, text-based adventure game in Python. Little so it was, all, it, was all like, it was all like command line stuff. Yeah. So I'd do like, you know, random encounters and do like a Pokemon style back and forth battle. I did all that. Hell yeah. Uh, I was also into WoW, so I, I programmed my own macro for uh, my shot rotations. So I played a hunter and I was really into the, the theory crafting for your shot rotations. Yep. So I wrote a macro that had all my rotations down the timings all into one button. So all I have to do is sit there, you know, click on the boss and then mash one button. And I'll go through my entire shot rotations. And everything everything lined up so nicely that by the time I got to the last skill, the first one was off cooldown. And that's, like uh, that's some science right there. That's what that yeah. is. I just had, like, never played the... WoW. <laughs> really? Never. It's probably a good thing. Yep. Ah, oh, man. Yeah. If you're, if you're, like, any into Destiny, you would have been way into WoW at the time. And that's why I never played WoW. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had to quit WoW in, in college because I, I failed out of calculus. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to quit and then retake it. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
reasons that Joe was... never played WoW. I would have had to. Yeah, I probably just wouldn't have had the sense to quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me a while. <laughs> I am. I'm not afraid to admit that anymore. <laughs> So did you, like, I'm curious, you said you went through some of those programming classes. The programming classes they sent me through in high school were through Eclipse. Was it through the same thing? Oh, wow. Uh, we did Eclipse in college. Um, so I went, I spent two years at a community college, and they did C++ there in Eclipse, yeah. I believe. Um, Which community college? Uh, ICC. Oh, okay. Is yeah, I went there for two years, and I transferred to Bradley well, to finish up my undergrad. When I tried to take C++ at ICC, my first instructor, uh, it was a online class, and she didn't grade any assignment until the end of the class. And basically, the whole class failed because we didn't follow her code methodology, so she just failed us. And mm. uh, I, I told the dean that I found that unacceptable, and he agreed with me. So... Uh, he's like, you can take the class again. I, this was with Josh, by the way. And he's like, you can take the class again, but we're not offering it online this next semester, so you have to take it in the classroom. And it's like, ah, oh, I guess that's fine. So then the next instructor that we got had never programmed in C++, so she was learning with us. She was a Java <laughs> programmer. And... Uh, I nice. was trying to program uh, through terminals using like GCC compilers and stuff because I was doing Ugh. Linux. I, I was programming for ROS. So like I, I needed to be able to do it for real and not use like Visual Studio. And uh, the whole class was just like, how to use Visual Studio is what it turned into. It's like this, mm -hmm. this is not what I need to accomplish my goals, lady. <laughs> <laughs> School isn't about learning valuable lessons it's not about learning things you can actually take into the real world joe no that's uh, not apparently my it, icc instructor actually played aeon online if you remember what that was i do where it, it's like an mmo where you're all like angels yep and you can fly around and shit i do yeah. I, I vaguely remember that game it was, i don't think it lasted very long no it didn't <laughs> so like What's been one of the things that when you're really when you're really stuck on a coding problem and like you're ready to give up what what is that thing that keeps you like avenging to get this done like self-loathing <laughs> Yeah fair enough It depends on the end goal I mean if it's a if it's a personal project and I don't have to get it done i might not get it done uh when i have ran into those things for work you know it's a i have to get this done i have to figure this problem out because somebody's depending on me to figure this problem out yeah and that's when i turn to the good old stack exchange and and my friends like aaron that actually know how to code and <laughs> are like dude semicolons they're important <laughs> Use them. <laughs> oh, I guess that should be the one, the biggest question of all time: um, tabs or spaces? Oh God! <laughs> so I know, I know it's a meme at this point, <laughs> but it's kind of a non-issue because tabs are spaces. Yeah, I'm, yes. and 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 your editor just interprets them as spaces, and it just automatically indented like what four spaces yeah yeah i mean yeah. white space definitely matters but yeah. if i can but i definitely tab complete four keystrokes and one i'm gonna do the one yeah because i'm lazy <laughs> and now fred's like you idiots i hate all of you yeah. <laughs> is tab or is fred a spaces guy it's fred fred is spaces Fred's a weirdo. We got we got into a. He really also uses edge. Fun argument. He Wait, uses, he uses edge? edge. I know, right? <laughs> he uses the edge browser. Oh my like god! A weirdo. Why? It's because I don't he, know, man. It's because he's old. Fred, Fred is our, our <laughs> resident <laughs> retired electrical engineer, and he's one of my favorite people. But like that that just seems to be a characteristic of like if you were if you grew up in the. Internet Explorer is the only internet 
browser age, you fight to use Edge. My, my grandma's the same way. My dad's the same way. And I constantly am like, why? There's so many better options. Like, it, at least use something that tries. I mean, I like. I, I guess like I, I want could you to use something see... weird like Opera. <laughs> you know, I got hop or Hopera, Hopera in my browser. I got Opera in my uh, toolbar because I still use that. Um, I love Opera. Opera's great. Um, the only reason I could see Fred potentially using Edge is because of his great like community outreach, and like everybody else around him in that community must use edge because like so one of our our uh fred he fred. actually runs a cool uh senior tech learning uh outreach for the community and uh it's really cool he he teaches seniors how to use tech um but i don't know maybe i'm wrong but <laughs> Just like Aaron says all the time when we're always fighting about whether or not we should be using open source software, Fred should be an ambassador to his community and use the right internet browser. That's I hope right. you're listening to you're this, not, Fred. You're not you're goddamn wrong. goddamn right. <laughs> we know better. We should be ambassadors. We yes. should be setting an example. Yes. And In I'm not... some cases, user, user ability should always be first priority when it comes to community outreach, not pushing an agenda. So not having Linux on every single machine. Hey, well, that's it, fine. It's, but like, it's an opportunity cost, man. If we don't push an agenda, somebody else is. It's not pushing an agenda to not have somebody use an operating system that is an open door for hackers and has been proved time. Or not operating system. Oh, he's system, fired up. Internet I can browser. See it. He's fired up. <laughs> Welcome to the open source episode. <laughs> 2.0. So as a maker, Aaron, what do you prefer to use for your source control method? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're joking. Sort of. <laughs> so the de facto standard. Right, right, right. But then... Microsoft bought them. I was going to say. <laughs> and now I'm not sure. So, I mean, so far, GitHub hasn't changed that much, has it? Not. It's not, where not. all of your stuff went and who now yeah. technically owns the repositories. Like, yeah. Just I've because. a lot of theories. Yeah. So. It's, um, it's the whole cloud thing, man. It's all, it's all someone else's computer, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So one theory was that Microsoft wanted access to all the private repositories that were in GitHub. So since they own the servers now, they would have access to all the private repos. Um, Damn, they got all my just movies to see, now. Just to see what was in there. Um, another, another thing that I heard that's actively being done is they're using it as almost a talent repository. So they can skim all the repos and see how talented developers are and use that as a platform to like sell to recruiters or sell to um, companies as a recruiter themselves. I mean, um, essentially, essentially leveraging your own code for their own gain to get you a job. Not a unquote. horrible idea. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't like any of those. Yeah. So I've actually moved all my stuff to GitLab. So I've been using GitLab's um, cloud service. I was wondering. Um, yeah, so they are they are dual licensed. So they they have an open source um, community license or community version, and then they have a dual licensed commercial version, which has a lot of uh, extra features. But what I like is that they have uh, the community version has built in um, continuous integration and continuous deployment um, features. And hmm. what that means is you can set up a pipeline, so when you push code to your repo. It, it can automatically run unit tests, so it can test your software for you automatically. Um, it can, it can, you know, package things up if things need to be zipped up or whatever. It can do a lot of stuff for you and integrate with things. And I just like that it's built in. So I have all my personal stuff on that now. Sweet. Uh, the only thing I don't have on there is my personal portfolio uh, static website. That's still on GitHub pages. I was looking into uh, migrating it to the GitLab pages. 
but they currently don't have automatic let's encrypt cert renewal. Mm. So you have to manually renew the certificate, whereas GitHub has automatic already. I like things like that to just work and not have to worry about it. So that's Fair why enough. it's still on GitHub. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, if push came to shove, I'd be able to, you know, set up my own GitLab server here at home. Push. Zing. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, I can push my code to my own personal server, and then that could also then push it to GitLabs or any other repo that I want. So I could also uh, self-host all of that. Nice. So what all did they change when they when they did the dual license? Because we we had went to them at work uh, for a little while, and I, I think they're still on it. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I remember there being some potential issues with how the licensing worked and um, maybe the support that was behind it. I can't really remember. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain off the top of my head. Okay. Um, usually it's support. Um, I But I do think that um, GitLab Enterprise does have more features. It probably has more to do with uh, authentication, maybe some LDAP or OAuth, um, more enterprise-type authentications. You know, those, those things. Are, they don't? <laughs> I said those things. Yeah. The, the LDAPs, those are important. Yeah, I, yeah usually those are... <laughs> Those are behind an enterprise uh, paywall. But again, we don't need those as hobbyists. Right. Unless you're into, unless you're a hobbyist authenticator. Which, you know, that's a thing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aaron's into hobbyist security. Definitely. <laughs> so, do either of you have plans to enhance your code skills? for future maker projects. Definitely. Yeah. Like, that's a hard one. Like, I definitely want to. Uh, and I'm definitely going to be pushing myself. Funny enough, like Joe mentioned, the LED contact staff, one of the th one of the props that I would love to build over the next year is a uh, LED uh, daredevil contact staff that would like break apart and go into nunchucks mode and like be able to spin and do stuff like that. Um, and so I have the design in my head and I just need to like sketch it out, but I also need to like code that to where it will work with the uh, LED libraries and whatnot. And so it's like, I definitely have the desire um, and I want to learn it, <laughs> but uh, it's a little intimidating to be honest. Like coding can definitely cause a lot of frustration um, when all you're doing is like soldering stuff up and getting it ready. Um, and now you're being delayed by hours because your code is missing a semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That never happens. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, like, um, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like the the main reason I haven't done more code is I just haven't had the time to focus on it. And right now I supposedly keep telling myself I have all the time in the world to focus on those things and uh it's just not happening. But um I'm finding more and more that my my coding chops are what are holding me back in the projects that I want to work on. So I want to do more advanced CNC projects um, with interfacing with IOs and stuff. So I need to be able to do lower level Python programming to be able to do that. Um, there's Python's some... not that low level. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> I need to be able to interface with the, the hooks and the hardware layers for like yeah. Linux CNC um, right. or yeah, there, there's some interesting things I would like to do with the tool changer and um, a lot of that, at least the ways I'm thinking of it are, you know, the, the tool changer itself will fire off an IO to trigger something. And then that something is going to have um, like a computer vision component or a, um, a, a whole another Arduino driven component to like do a gripper or something like that. Like um, Chris and I were just at an automation show in Chicago last Thursday and um, you know, just a 10 minute conversation with the sales rep is like, Oh, I know how I could do this. 
And you know, since then, I've been in my head thinking about how I can do a a smart robotic gripper um, with some Arduino code that is just controlled with a couple IOs from my machine, where they it doesn't have to interface and understand all the things that um, need to happen with the gripper. It just needs to be able to tell the gripper open and close, and then all that stuff happens elsewhere. Right. Like, so those those are the kinds of things that I'm really interested in getting better at code for, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll hear about them on the podcast pretty soon because yeah, because I actually do them, or maybe you ask me about them in three months and I'm like, Psh, I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, abstractions are really powerful development tool. You know, so just like G code, you know, uh, you know, Fusion doesn't care about you know how the step promoters have to turn all yeah. it cares about is saying the the tool needs to go 20 millimeters in this direction and then that's up to the the controller itself to then translate that into you know instructions for the motors right yeah, yeah it's for a... me personally i've been uh i've been going back and forth on what i want to spend my free time on uh, right now it's been a lot on the makerspace access control system but that project's been so long in the tooth I think but, that's a noble project, and you need to continue it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, you know, every every other month, you know, something happens at the space, and it's like, we really need something like this. Yeah. It would just solve all the problems. Yeah. So that's what keeps me going on that. But um, after that project, though, I think I'm going to start focusing more on my own personal um, coding skills. Um, there's a couple avenues I've been kind of putting off learning, like uh, I really want to get into more machine learning and some computer vision, because I'm seeing those in a lot of applications now, yes. in a lot of different you know, use cases, and I have zero experience with it, so I kind of want to start learning stuff. I know I know there's some really good libraries for it now, so it may not be as hard as it was years ago. Yeah. But it's definitely something I want to start looking into. Yeah, I have some background in computer vision, but not necessarily machine learning, so that's been something that i've wanted to dive into but it's it's a difficult thing to just like dive into i'm gonna learn machine learning today and it's like nah you're gonna spend a year and a half learning machine learning and you know money to get <laughs> hardware and i saw a joke on reddit yesterday about machine learning where uh if you sit there and you just change your code willy-nilly until it works that's <laughs> called a hacky solution and not a good best practice but if you do it fast enough, it's called machine learning. <laughs> and then you get paid four times your salary. Yes. <laughs> so it's all depending on how fast you do it. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I wish that wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've, seen, I've been watching a lot of the YouTube videos on like neural nets and stuff like that. And I think it's more of just learning the underlying concepts that make it work. Because the actual coding of it, isn't, from what I've seen, isn't that bad. Um, as an experienced developer, it's just more of knowing the concepts and what you have to make the code do. Actually, actually writing the code is usually not too bad, but like, how do you how do you make it? Like the the architecture of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I have no clue on. Yeah, that that's me with a lot of code. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, this is kind of your topic. What else do you want to add? Hmm. Don't feel that. Because you have nothing physical to show doesn't mean you didn't do anything. That's yeah. a good thing to add. Fair yes. enough. It's, it's very important to understand that just because you don't have something to hold in your hand does not mean that time was wasted, you know? Because that's something that I've been struggling with and like my entire developer life. And never let somebody undervalue the amount of effort that you put into your code. There's, there's so many people that don't understand how hard code can be just like or like well you know like we'll just have aaron over here code that up in c plus plus real quick and aaron that should take you like an hour right and then you're like that's like a month and a half prototype i got this great and, app idea and, and like yeah <laughs> or that i got this great <laughs> app idea for like finding other people in crowds at concerts and we can create this like mesh network over bluetooth and it should be really easy i think right <sighs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I never had also, that idea. <laughs> also, don't be afraid that your code's going to suck. 
It's yeah. always going to suck. Yeah, because your code's going to suck. Maybe it will always suck. Until it doesn't. No. Yeah. Um, the best thing you can do is keep rewriting it until it sucks less. Yeah. Fair um, enough. I, I've been doing this for, I'm talking like I'm old, but I've only been doing this for like six or seven years now developing. You're old. And, <laughs> and even my first attempt at writing anything is, it's usually naive where it works, but it's not the way it should be done. Mm-hmm. When, the important thing is just to get it working. Then once it works, you can go back through and say, okay, well, where is it inefficient? Where am I duplicating logic or duplicating code? Keep going through and iterating through it, and eventually you have a nice condensed down version. Much like you know, writing a paper where you'll, you'll write a first draft and it'll suck and you have extra crap you don't need. You read through it, you cut stuff out, you switch things around. So it's, all, it's, it's an iterative process. So don't be afraid that your code looks bad or it's not great at the start. Just keep going through it. Well, it's, it's the same thing in a mechanical design, too. Like the, the first time I oh, yeah. you go through and you design something in a mechanical design, it's never going to be very good. And then you go through and you refine it and you figure out where things don't make sense. And then um, you know after that, you end up with something halfway makeable. And that's always a really good feeling. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you remember I went through three revisions of the uh, the laser table. Yeah, and yep. that that first revision was way too complicated. Yeah, you know. And then we sat down, we had a design review, and we we're like, "Hey, we can make this way more simple." Yeah. Does that thing work? By the way, it works great. Yeah. It's it's definitely nice. wobbly, partially due to the the lead screws are slightly warped. It doesn't and matter. No smooth rods, but yeah, it doesn't matter because it only moves when you're not firing the laser. Yeah. So. You just need to set it once, and then you're good. So, yeah, it works great. Hmm. Um, one thing I found was that it's a bit of a, a coincidence, but right when you when you home the, the material, so I have, I have this planned out, so you have the limit switch, like a Z min limit switch uh, at the top of the laser bed. The idea is you put your material on the bed, you home the machine, the bed will raise up to hit the limit switch, but you also have your material hitting it as well. So now you're humming the machine with reference to your stock material. So now we can have it um, home and then maybe drop the bed down a couple millimeters to be in the right focal length for the laser. But coincidentally, at Z0 is the focal point mm. on the bed. Nice. So it doesn't have to move at all. Uh, I did not plan that. <laughs> Fair enough. Excellent. I'm not that, I'm not that good. <laughs> I have definitely done stupid things like that where it's like, wow, this is a really excellent coincidence and I'm glad it worked out this way because if had it worked out just slightly different, this whole thing wouldn't be usable. <laughs> 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 so that's always fun. Well, that's all I wanted to add. Fair enough. Joe, you got anything else you want to add? Uh, no, just you know, never let anyone discount your efforts and... Uh, if you're like me and you're good at mechanical things and you're good at uh, making physical objects, you know, don't be afraid to dive into code just because it's intimidating. Like there's lots of good tutorials out there. And as long as you have a project that you you're interested in, you're invested in, you'll figure it out. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing is just always being willing to learn and, you know, it, it was hard for me to start diving into code when all I was doing was like making hello worlds and and figuring out like money with C++ because I didn't care. But once I started working on projects where I was invested in the outcome and I really understood why I, it mattered, um, things got a lot easier. And but that's just kind of how I've always worked. So, no, I'll, I'll finish off by saying I, I definitely agree with the two statements and I'll echo what Aaron says, especially from the perspective of a, of an editor. Uh, sometimes your work is not going to be, sometimes all the hard work that you put into something is not going to be seen. Um, but that shouldn't discount all the hard work that you put into it. Um, whether that's coding, building a website, doing a video, editing a photo, building an awesome led matrix, like, Sometimes it's not going to be seen, but that doesn't mean that you 
didn't put all that hard work into it. And that's way it should be appreciated. And you absolutely are a maker for doing all of that hard work. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, with that, um, I think we'll we'll cap it at that. I want to thank everybody for sticking through to the end of this welcome back episode to our normal format. Welcome, um, back. <laughs> welcome back. Uh, and we thank you for sticking through till the end. Uh, and look forward to coming back next week with another new episode. So this has been Makers on Tap. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. Est. 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 Est.